yeah, it's good to be here and uh, and thanks for coming. So the talk I'm going to give the next 15 minutes uh, is about some of our work uh, on ocean deoxygenation effects on threatened sharks. And it's the changing twilight zone. And what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the twilight zone and how that's changing and also what influences we think that might have on threatened sharks. And I should say that as well as myself, obviously this work is, is um, uh, uh, contributed to by the research group and all our collaborators as well. And I'll introduce you to some of those during and, and after the talk as well. Okay, so. So what is the twilight zone? Well, the twilight zone is that uh, area, that volume of the ocean from 200 meters to 1,000 meters. It's uh, the, called the mesopelagic zone more, more sort of regularly. Um, it's called the twilight zone because at sort of 200 meters, there's only about 1% of the incident uh, sunlight that reaches that depth. So it, it's a zone that's obviously not supporting any photosynthesis. Uh, down at the sort of 1,000 meters, there's hardly uh, a, a no light at all, and beyond that is termed the midnight zone. But this twilight zone is interesting because it's very poorly studied, actually, because of the logistical difficulties of, of getting there and making various measurements. But incredibly, it's, it's uh, a volume of water, about 20% of the ocean volume is this twilight zone. And obviously, it, it doesn't uh, support any photosynthesis itself. In that, in that volume, but it does have important roles in uh, drawing down uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and also recycling carbon uh, and uh, modifying these into nutrients, which are then available to uh, phytoplankton and, and zooplankton in the productive zone. And it, importantly, it's, the, it's an area of volume that's uh, that's got the world's largest and least exploited fish stock. So it's thought that uh, in the future, this could be uh, one of the problems that the twilight zone faces um, in as much that there could be fishing for the huge biomass. I mean, it's, it's estimated that anything between sort of one sort of 50 billion tons of fish biomass are in that uh, mesopelagic sort of twilight zone. So there's a lot of recycling of organic material and obviously a, a lot of particulate organic, organic matter is also sinking down into the abyssal uh, area. It also supports this incredible uh, animal migration. It's the largest animal migration on Earth, and that is responsible for the active transport of this uh, particular organic matter, or at least a lot of it. Probably about 50% of the vertical flux of carbon is due to this uh, uh, animal migration of zooplankton and also large uh, nectonic animals such as squid and fishes. And one of the problems is that fishing and climate uh, change is thought to uh, likely alter how the twilight zone functions uh, as an ecosystem. So, so as well as uh, sort of lots of spooky looking sort of squid and octopuses and, and, and mesopelagic fishes, there's also pelagic sharks that visit the twilight zone. And this is something that we didn't really know about until a few years ago. These are uh, a couple of traces you can see on the slide here, a couple of uh, depth profiles uh, of a blue shark and a short fin mako shark. And before the advent of sort of telemetry technology where we could track these animals for long periods of time and record the temperature of the water and the swimming depth, it was thought that these were largely sort of epipelagic fishes. But what we're finding is that these sharks, these pelagic sharks, are visiting the twilight zone uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And as you can see from that plot, the warm colors represent warm temperatures, so very warm at the surface in the first sort of 100, 150 meters. But then further down, obviously, it gets very cold. And we've also had blues and mako sharks that we've tracked in the Atlantic going down into the midnight zone as well, where it's completely dark. And the temperatures there and in the sort of lower reaches of the twilight zone is about five degrees uh, centigrade. So it's incredible uh, a range of temperatures that these sharks are experiencing. And they're going there on a daily basis. And so uh, we're asking questions such as, you know, why are they going there? What is it that they're doing? What's the point of them going down and spending an hour at five degrees when in fact uh, they would normally be in water of about 15 to 20 degrees. So 
lots of questions uh, following that discovery of these pelagic sharks entering the twilight zone. And one of the things that's of interest when you've got these high sort of oxygen demand predators such as pelagic sharks uh, entering an area such as the twilight zone, it's a particular area that has had uh, uh, significant changes, uh, not only uh, in uh, temperature uh, above the zone, but also oxygen within the zone. And so uh, global open ocean deoxygenation uh, has been measured since about the 1960s. And you can see in this plot here, the blue and the red colors, the red colors denote where there's been oxygen increases over the last 60 years, and the blue colors denote where there's been uh, oxygen uh, decreases over the last sort of 60 years. And what you can see is that in that sort of equatorial band, largely, there have been big decreases uh, in oxygen in the open ocean. And it's thought that about 2% of the ocean's oxygen has been lost since about 1960. And obviously, this is occurring due to a, a sort of interaction of all sorts of different factors, from ocean warming, increasing the temperature of that surface layer, uh, increased stratification and productivity in that surface layer as a consequence. More sinking of this organic matter, which is increasing microbial respiration in some of these equatorial regions. And of course, changing circulation, sort of deep water uh, ventilation is often lower in these areas. And those sort of factors contributing to, together have led to these decreases in, in ocean oxygen. Now, this is a, a particular problem, we think, for some of the high oxygen demand predators because, of course, they rely on, on high levels of oxygen. And so one th the thing that's interesting is in these global oxygen minimum zones, in those equatorial regions of the twilight zone, you have the coming together of these, these factors which drive down uh, the oxygen, dissolved oxygen concentration uh, in these layers. And so we're interested to know, you can see uh, the global map here, the sort of the red areas, uh, um, pink areas are where there's very low oxygen. And you can see in the Pacific, those pink areas there uh, are, are sometimes termed dead zones because they have uh, very, very low concentrations uh, of oxygen, dissolved oxygen. Uh, we've been working uh, mainly off West Africa, where you see there is that Atlantic, that equatorial uh, tropical uh, Atlantic uh, oxygen minimum zone. And that starts at about sort of 100 to 200 meters depth, and then the oxygen starts to decrease uh, right down to about 800 meters before it comes back again. It increases in oxygen. So you have this sort of, this sort of ball of hypoxia that's uh, extending over a huge area. And it's thought that globally there's about 7% uh, of this, uh, um, uh, these oxygen minimum zones uh, uh, in, the, in the global ocean. So we're interested to know what impact these sorts of zones, and obviously with climate change, what's happening is that since 1960, these zones have actually expanded. So these balls of hypoxia are, are, are getting bigger, are expanding. And we're interested to know how animals and, and sharks in particular uh, are interacting with these areas. Uh, there's a number of, of ideas about why that might be. As you can appreciate, if you've got an expanding sort of ball of hypoxia, this might, if, if the sharks have uh, uh, physiological limits below which they won't, below that which they won't go down, they won't dive down. Uh, then you have uh, sharks that are going to be habitat compressed into the top layers, and with warming as well, that will increase the costs uh, for these sharks and the energetic costs. And this could also uh, mean that there are uh, demographic and sort of life history changes in terms of their growth rates. But is it that there, are, there is this habitat compression? And with, we think that it might be a problem because if they are habitat compressed, then vessels might have a, a much easier uh, chance of catching them. So the vulnerability of the sharks will change as a consequence of this global uh, change in the dissolved oxygen content. And this is a particular problem for the pelagic sharks because uh, overall there's about 100 uh, million sharks uh, caught by uh, fisheries every year. About half of those are pelagic sharks, and about 70% of that half uh, are blue sharks. So blue sharks uh, are, are harvested at very uh, uh, high rates, but there's very little management for those species. So it could be a problem if there is this broad-scale habitat compression of sharks into the more surface layers.
Of course, uh, it could be that uh, that in itself, increase, the increased catch rates draw in other vessels, which then you get this exacerbation uh, of the uh, catches, which can lead to sort of overfishing. And it, if indeed there aren't any physiological limits, imagine if, the, if our high oxygen demand sharks aren't um, seemingly bothered by these physiological limits, maybe they have uh, adaptations to uh, uh, persist in low oxygen water then we might expect that their vulnerability to fisheries might not increase, it might stay the same. Uh, equally likely is that in fact the vulnerability will be much, much higher because not only are the sharks habitat compressed into the surface layer by this expanding hypoxia, but also the prey species are too. And where there might be prey species uh, uh, occupying sort of lower volumes of seawater, uh, then of course it might be that the sharks actually stick around, they hang around a lot longer and prefer to be in these particular habitats. And that can lead to a ha what's called a habitat trap. And that's when the vulnerability might go way up, the susceptibility to be caught by fisheries might go way up. So what have we been doing? Well, over the last uh, couple of years, two, three years, uh, as part of a NERC uh, grant, we've been tracking uh, blue sharks. These are tracks of blue sharks. The top panel there uh, are sharks that have had those black tags fitted to their fins and then they've been released into the sea and you can see there that the coloured dots going south are those blue sharks that have then encountered this oxygen minimum zone uh, off of West Africa. The panel below are tags which record the swimming depth of those blue sharks. So you can see that when the, shark, the blue sharks do migrate south seasonally uh, they do encounter this oxygen minimum zone. And what we found uh, from simulations is that the sharks, the real sharks, spend much longer there than do uh, random sort of moving sharks. Uh, so there's a higher chance of them being retained by this, by this habitat. Um, what do they do in terms of their diving? Can they get down into these oxygen minimum zones? Well, you can see the panels on the, on the left uh, screen show you the maximum diving depths of blue sharks in relation to the oxygen minimum zone. So they're, they're coming from sort of normoxic water and swimming sort of into the oxygen minimum zone. And what we generally find, you can see from that, is that the maximum dive depth generally gets shallower. But it's, it's not perfect. Blue sharks, it seems, are able to go into some of the low oxygen water, at least for some of the time, maybe for short periods, and they may have adaptations that allow them to do that. But one of the problems with our analysis so far is that we've used modelled uh, DO data that have come from oceanographic databases. And obviously that might not be what the shark's experiencing. The shark might be experiencing very, very different uh, concentrations of oxygen. And so our new project, this uh, European Research Council Advance Grant that was awarded uh, to us, the, uh, to the team in Plymouth at the MBA, uh, will actually pro make progress uh, through new instruments and data. And so collaborating with uh, Nuno Kairos and his team at Sibio, uh, a new tag has been developed, which is a novel tag that will uh, record oxygen uh, concentration uh, as the shark is swimming. And you can see in the panel here, we're, we're aiming to uh, tackle sort of sharks and tuners. But we tested the tag recently as part of the NERC project on, on an ocean sunfish. And that, those plots you can see there are ocean sunfish swimming depths. So we're able to get temperature, swimming depth, uh, dissolved oxygen, the compass heading uh, of, of the fish as well, uh, over sort of, you know, a sub-second level. So we're getting loads and loads of data on the oxygen environment that the animal is occupying. And what we can do in, the, in this ERC uh, project, what we're proposing is that we gather this empirical data on what sharks and tuners actually experience around these oxygen minimum zones. And we start to model their responses in, in, uh, in relation to not only the DO, uh, but also other aspects of the environment. And we can use those relationships to understand more about the physiological limits, the tolerances of these high oxygen demand predators in the oxygen minimum zone. And there's also another very cool tag that we're developing, which is a variant on, on the tag you saw last, which uh, actually has a video camera. As well as sort of physiological limits and tolerances, we're also very interested 
in understanding the ecological importance. You'll, you'll remember I, I mentioned about it could be a habitat trap. It could be a place where, you know, sharks like to hang out. And so we want to know why they might be diving deep. What is it that draws them there? And one of the key things, of course, will be the, uh, the abundance of prey. There are lots of uh, cephalopods, hypoxia tolerant cephalopods and fishes that live in the oxygen minimum zone that migrate uh, this dial vertical migration up to the surface at night. And so it could be that the sharks are entering the oxygen minimum zones to uh, sort of find these prey uh, at depths. And there could be an advantage to doing that. It could be that if sharks can do it, let's say, then other predators like tuners uh, with much higher oxygen demand might not be able to do it uh, so frequently or so easily. So we have this tag, you can see it on the left there, we've got a video camera actually fitted into the tag and the VHF antenna there is when the tag pops off from the animal, so we record depth and temperature uh, and also acceleration as well. We can get the sort of activity of the animal from sort of uh, tail flaps and uh, angles and movements of the body and from that we can uh, sort of have a proxy for, for their metabolic rate. And the release timer enables the tag to pop off and then with the VHF we actually uh, are on a boat with an antenna uh, sort of trying to find this tag and sort of spitting feathers and, and doing all sorts of things to try and find it. And hopefully we will and we'll be able to then get that video data off. And you can see some uh, images on the right from our collaborators, uh, um, uh, Yuki Watanabe's group, uh, that's actually uh, uh, Itsumi Nakamura's uh, images there and you can see that's attached to a sunfish and it's, it's actually a, a blue shark cruises past the sunfish. You can just see the blue shark in the top panel but also the sunfish of course is interested in jellyfish. So we hope to be able to image not just sort of predators and prey but also hopefully estimate the abundance uh, of uh, the prey that might be in, in those uh, oxygen minimum zones. And as well as sort of physiological tolerances and limits, that's part of the ERC project, the ecological importance, we're also going to do something uh, very bold, which is to uh, try to understand how the sharks interact with Lodeo, how do they manage to do it in, in sort of energetically in terms of energy intake and expenditure. What sorts of strategies might they have to be able to uh, get net energy gain from these sorts of environments? And so for that, we're intending to uh, use the methods of, of colleagues of ours, collaborators of ours, Nick Payne and, and Jason Simmons, who built this incredible mega flume, a seagoing swim tunnel respirometer. And you can see in those panels on the right, those photos, that there's actually a, a sort of three, three meter zebra shark actually in there. And the idea of this swim tunnel is that you're essentially exercising the shark. You're spinning water around this uh, sort of uh, annulus, this sort of torus and the shark is swimming against it and you, you're able to measure the oxygen consumption. So these are direct measurements and what we hope to do is to mimic the shark's trips into the oxygen minimum zone. We'll uh, be able to manipulate the level of oxygen in that large seagoing respirometer and mimic how the blue shark moves into an oxygen minimum zone and moves out again. Uh, we've done it on a smaller scale with sort of school sharks about sort of uh, 60 centimetres long but we've yet to do it on a two three metre pelagic shark so hopefully we'll all come back in one piece. So the idea of those direct measurements is then to undertake this sort of bioenergetic modelling to try and figure out what the, the costs and benefits of these oxygen minimum zones excursion are for these pelagic sharks. Um, and just sort of finally the last sort of component uh, of the ERC project is to then use that empirical data on physiological and ecological uh, uh, importance uh, and the effects of, of various physiological and ecological factors on the behavior to model uh, the future shark habitats. You can see on the right, uh, on the left there, there are some panels. This is our sort of preliminary work, just using uh, uh, sort of the swimming, the, the shark swimming dive data in relation to oxygen. And what you can see there is that in the present, uh, the maximum dive depth is actually only limited around the coast of West Africa on the, on the shelf, the continental shelf of, of Africa. Um, but in 2050, we've modeled how the predicted maximum dive depth will change. And what you can see there is, is much more red color. That means much more shallower sort of uh, a vertical extent of these sharks in the future. And that's due to this expansion of the oxygen minimum zone.
So with this new data, we can get much sort of better model estimates of what the shark habitats and tuna habitats will look like in the future. But also we want to try and figure out how such changes will alter the vulnerability uh, to fisheries uh, exploitation. And I'll just sort of leave you, uh, the sort of last slide is really just to uh, uh, give you some uh, uh, preliminary data that indicates that there may be uh, some impact of oxygen minimum zones with the actual mortality of blue sharks. Here you can see what we've mapped here is the catches by the Spanish longlining fleet of blue sharks. And where you can see sort of red squares, that's much, much higher catches. The dotted line that you can see sort of in, in the shape of almost a shark's head actually, uh, with the 3.5 milliliters of oxygen <coughs> per liter um, uh, oxycline uh, marker there. You can see that there are higher catches generally on the northern edge and the western uh, area uh, of the oxygen minimum zone. So that's catches that are occurring in the waters above the oxygen minimum zone. And if we actually then sort of tra transect across the oxygen minimum zone and actually uh, uh, sort of relate the oxygen and the drop of oxygen to the catches, those are in the right hand panels, you see that the oxygen, as you, go, as you move across from normoxic waters, if you're at 100 meters depth and you go across the oxygen minimum zone, the oxygen, those red dots there, uh, drop down. Uh, the, the oxygen drops from about sort of five milliliters of oxygen per liter down to about nearly one uh, uh, milliliter of oxygen per liter. And that's uh, very severely hypoxic for, for most uh, um, uh, animals, invertebrates and vertebrates in the ocean. And what you can see is that the catches actually seem to peak where, when the oxygen is dropping the most. And that seems to be the case further south as well over the extent of the oxygen minimum zone. Catches are generally higher when the oxygen uh, is much lower at depth. And this implies, this infers a, a habitat compression effect that it, uh, is acting to enhance the catches. It could be that um, the oxygen minimum zone itself is acting as some sort of barrier, uh, or, or it could be, so, so that would entrain sharks into a certain area along the northern edge, for example, or it could be that there's uh, aggregation of prey and the sharks are orientating to that. Either way, there looks to be the sort of first sort of evidence that these oxygen minimum zones, these expanding oxygen minimum zones, might be a habitat trap for sharks and perhaps other pelagic fishes as well. And of course, that in the future suggests the potential uh, for overfishing of these habitat compressed sharks. So look, I've given you a flavor of the sorts of studies that we'll be doing over the next sort of five years, investigating how these large high oxygen demand predators are going to be responding, uh, being influenced by this, these expansions uh, in oxygen minimum zones. And obviously, hopefully, I'll be able to come back and, and give you updates on how uh, sharks like this one, this is a short fin mako shark, how much their vertical extent is being pushed closer to the surface. And just lastly, uh, just to say uh, and acknowledge the, the fantastic group that I've been working with over the last few years, particularly uh, Nick Humphreys, Gonzalo Musientes, who's our, our tagging king, uh, and Nuno Queiroz, who does some amazing work developing some of these tags uh, and some of the analysis that I've presented. So anyway, look, that's just a flavor of what we've been up to. Hopefully, I'll, I'll, we'll all be in one piece and I can come back at, at a future time uh, and tell you uh, what progress we've made in answering some of those questions. So anyway, I'll leave the talk there. Thanks very much.